studying the recommendations. Bond Commission report goes public. Commission recommends action against wrongdoers while lost to be recovered from responsible parties. Going for good governance. President Maitripala Sirisena says Operation No. 2 on bond scandal has begun after the successful completion of Operation No. 1. Probes preceding probes. The United National Party to appoint a three-member committee to study report of the Bond Commission. Following UN resolutions, a 20-nation meeting on North Korea considers imposing unilateral sanctions on North Korea. Zimbabwe upset Sri Lanka. Zimbabwe beat Sri Lanka by 12 runs in the second ODI of the Tri-Nation Series at Nirpur. A very good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Katharina Chang. Now on to your top story tonight. The report produced by the Commission of Inquiry appointed to investigate and inquire into and report on the issuance of Treasury bonds during the period from February 1, 2015 to 31st March 2016 was made public today. The much-awaited document was made available online via the official website of the President's office. The report was produced after the Commission of Inquiry conducted a total of 117 days of public hearings, during which 71 witnesses were examined. In its report, the Commission of Inquiry states that they have determined that the government suffered an avoidable loss of 6.8 billion rupees as a direct result of the then Central Bank Governor Arjuna Mahindran's intervention in the Treasury bond auction held on February 27, 2015 and that Mahindran is liable and responsible for this loss. Accordingly, the Commission recommends that appropriate proceedings are instituted against Mahindran to recover their loss. The Commission observes that Mahindran acted in collusion with Perpetual Treasuries, therefore recommending that appropriate proceedings are instituted against Perpetual Treasuries Limited for the recovery of this loss. In connection to this, the Commission recommends that the Attorney General and other appropriate authorities consider whether Perpetual Treasuries used and benefited from price-sensitive inside information and market manipulation in the secondary market and if so, whether perpetual treasury should be prosecuted under the relevant provisions and recover the loss from PTL by a fine which is twice the value of the loss. The Commission goes on to recommend that the Commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption should consider whether Ravi Karanayaka, while he was Minister of Finance, derived a substantial benefit from the lease payments made by Walton Rao Associates for the lease of an apartment occupied by Ravi Karanayaka MP and his family and if so, determine whether appropriate action be taken against Ravi Karanayaka under the Bribery Act. It also recommends that the AG to consider whether some of the evidence given by Ravi Karanayaka before the Commission is shown to have been incorrect, if that is the case, whether Karanayaka should be prosecuted under the Penal Code or other relevant provision of the law. The report recommends that the AG consider whether PTL has wrongfully and fraudulently deleted call recordings for the purpose of concealing the true nature of transactions entered into by PTL and attempted to suppress evidence of wrongful acts. The Commission concludes that Jeffrey Aloysius and Arjun Aloysius have been the sole beneficial owners of PTL during the entire period of the Commission's mandate, although Arjun Aloysius had resigned from the post of Director of Perpetual Treasuries on the 16th of January 2015, it is evident that Arjuna Loisius and Kasun Polisena were in control of the day-to-day -day operations and transactions of the company. Referring to the meeting of the Market Operations Committee on the 27th of February 2015, the report says Arjuna Mahindran, the then Central Bank Governor, acted improperly and in excess of this authority when he acted unilaterally and without prior approval of the Monetary Board. With regard to the Treasury bond auction held on the 27th of February 2015, the Commission concludes that Mahindran knowingly acted improperly and wrongfully and interfered in the decision-making process at the Public Debt Department and thereafter at the Tender Board and directed that bids to the value of 10.058 billion rupees be accepted at the Treasury bond auction. It further states that Mahindran acted wrongfully, improperly, fraudulently and in gross breach of his duties as Governor of CBSL when he instructed to accept bids to the value of 10.058 billion rupees when he provided inside or price-sensitive information to the PTL. The report goes on to refer to the statement of Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe in Parliament on March 17th of 2015. The Commission says, quote, 
While we do not for even a moment presume to make any pronouncement on events that transpired in Parliament, we consider that Prime Minister would have been better advised if he had independently verified what had happened at the CBSL on the 27th of February 2015 before making any statement, placing reliance on what was held out to him by Mahindran and Deputy Governor Samarasiri. The evidence establishes that Mahindran had not been instructed or directed by the Prime Minister to act unilaterally and immediately suspend or stop direct placements on the 27th of February 2015, unquote. It says that instead, Prime Minister expected Mahindran to go through the due procedure. Pertaining to perpetual treasuries in the secondary market, the Commission says the total monetary gains made by perpetual treasuries from all sales of treasury bonds issued during the period from the 1st of February 2016 to the 31st of March 2016 aggregate to 11 billion rupees. Addressing the question of whether or not the fact that Mahindran was not a citizen of Sri Lanka precluded him from being appointed the governor of Central Bank, CBSL was not a question of law. Instead, it was a value judgment made by those who considered the wisdom of appointing Mahindran who was not a citizen of Sri Lanka. The report goes on to say that the time Mahindran was appointed Governor of Central Bank, the Prime Minister had been aware of the potential for a conflict of interest and has directed that. Mahindran must ensure Arjun Aloysius resigns from all positions he held in perpetual treasuries. It further adds that the Prime Minister had recommended that Aloysius divest himself of any shareholdings in perpetual treasuries. Subsequently, Aloysius had resigned from all positions he held in perpetual treasuries limited. Commenting on the Prime Minister's role on the matter, the report says although Mahindran repeatedly assured the Prime Minister that Aloysius would not under any circumstances play any role in the business activities of perpetual treasuries, the Commission considers that the more prudent course of action would have been for the Prime Minister to have independently verified whether Mahindran was in fact honouring the assurances he gave. The Commission regrets that Prime Minister did not take that course of action. The report by the Commission of Inquiry on the Central Bank bond issuances as well as the reports by the Presidential Commission of Inquiry to investigate and inquire into serious acts of fraud, corruption as abuse of power, state resources and privileges were handed over to the Speaker earlier today. Convening a media briefing, the Speaker later informed that a party leader's meeting will be held next Monday to discuss on further actions that need to be taken in this regard. Officers attached to the Presidential Secretariat handed over Pressifac reports and reports of the Commission of Inquiry to the Speaker's office this morning. <laughs> Speaker Karujai Surya held a media briefing after receiving the reports. We have received the 26 copies of the report by the Commission of Inquiry. However, it is in English. According to the standing order of the Parliament, the report should be presented in all three languages. We spoke to the Secretary of the President and made a request to provide these necessary translations. In addition, we also received 34 copies of the Pressifac report. We are not in a position to distribute the copies at the moment, as we have only one copy. We thought of keeping it in the Parliament Library, but later felt that it won't be safe. I will be tabling all these reports in Parliament on the 23rd of this month. Today, we spoke to the Leader of the House and the Opposition Leader and came up with a decision to have a party leaders' meeting on the 22nd of January at 9.30 a.m. We will then decide on further actions to be taken in this regard. <laughs> The President has mentioned in the letter that all the organizations and individuals mentioned in the report should receive a copy of the report and other relevant documents. The mentioned organizations or individuals must have a reasonable time period to go through the report and form their answers. Meanwhile, General Secretary of the UMP, Minister Kabi Hashim, explained the party's decision following the bond report being presented. Although there are allegations against the UNP over the bond issue, the report states that the party is not responsible here. We request the President to make the Pressifac report public just like how he did with this bond report. After consulting the leader of the party, we will appoint a three-member committee to look into the report. And if politicians representing the party are involved in this issue, as a party, we will make sure to take strong action against them. Meanwhile, former Minister of Finance Ravi Kaunanayaka challenged to reveal the actual report of the Commission of Inquiry on bond issuances. The real statement issued by the Bond Commission is yet to be presented. We are insisting that the government immediately present the report. Thereon, with the assistance of SP Disanayaka, Susil Premajanta and Dayasiri, we will point out the issues in the report without any fear. 
Meanwhile, speaking at a public rally in Kotahena, parliamentarian Ravi Karuna Nayak alleged that a group of people are attempting to mislead the president and prime minister. I say that fearlessly. They will continue to talk about this bond report. But the report of the bond commission is still not presented. Many names are mentioned in the report. My name and Rani Vikramasinghe's names are there. What crime did we commit? This is an attempt to defame the members of the UNP. When this report is finally presented, we will be able to see how it was improperly amended. There is a group of people who are trying to mislead the president and the prime minister. The weekly media briefing to inform the decisions by the Cabinet of Ministers took place this morning. Journalists inquired more details about yesterday's incident during the Cabinet meeting attended by the President, Prime Minister and Cabinet Ministers. Getting back to one of our local news now, according to Prime Minister's office sources, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe is due to make a special statement the on the current situation tomorrow. Meanwhile, speaking at the United National Party's Working Committee meeting today, the Prime Minister directed ministers of the United National Party to refrain from criticizing President Maitri Pala Sirisena. It has been very recent since the United National Party has been criticizing members of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. But there are a group of ministers and MPs from the SLFP who have been constantly criticizing the Prime Minister for the past two years. They do this while they hold ministerial positions and receive benefits. We who are part of the cabinet are saddened by what has occurred. This is the election period and one is bound to speak in an emotional manner on behalf of the party. But what the Prime Minister told us was to not speak to him in a hurtful manner. It was not an advice but a discussion. I have not criticized him unnecessarily. But the President too has a responsibility to control his ministers so that they will not criticize the Prime Minister. What occurred was there was a group of individuals who were leveling allegations against the President, particularly the young ministers. You cannot stop them. Therefore, those who started the criticism should understand that such a reaction is expected and it is not good. President Maitri Pala Sirisena says that he has instructed the Attorney General, the Director General of the Bribery Commission and the Governor of the Central Bank to proceed with legal action based on the final report of the Bond Commission. He made this announcement during a public rally of the United People's Freedom Alliance held in Alpitya today. A public rally organized by the United People's Freedom Alliance led by the Sri Lanka Freedom Party in order to garner support for the upcoming local government election was held at Alpiti in Gaul today. <laughs> Yesterday, I made a speech before the cabinet meeting and I began that with the preaching of the Lord Buddha. No one can engage in sinful activities and attempt to hide that. I'll tell you what these wrongful deeds I referred to are. It is a sinful act if you destroy the properties of the general public. If you steal money from the government's bank, that is a sinful act again. My speech to the cabinet ministers went on for about 30 to 45 minutes. I stated that we must prohibit ourselves from committing sinful acts against the public as we move forward as a government. So everyone should be ready for that. After that, I went out, had a cup of tea and rejoined the cabinet meeting. The largest theft that took place in the country's history is the central bank scandal. I appointed the presidential commission in order to probe this theft. You are aware that the report of the commission was presented to me last week. There was a story televised yesterday that a parliamentarian who was with us once upon a time, but now he is not, said that even though the report was presented, it is of no significance and it will be forgotten in time. I must tell you that the commission looking into the theft was only operation number one. I have come here to tell you that operation two was put into action this afternoon when I brought the attorney general to my office. I also invited the director general of bribery and corruption commission, governor of central bank as well as senior state councils. I came here after concluding the discussion with them at my office. 
I told them to assign fitting punishments to the thieves in order to reobtain the money that was stolen from the general public. I asked them how long it will take them to take legal steps against these fraudsters and to fix these issues and how long it would take for them to create a legal framework to bring justice to the matter. I will not hesitate to take action against all those who committed these frauds and this is my operation number two. Operation two Kriyatma Kerala. Leader of the JVP, Anurag Kumar Adisanayaka, accuses that the dispute between the UMP and SNFP is staged by the leaders of the two parties. Adisanayaka made these remarks at a campaign rally held in Abilipitiya yesterday. The JVP organized another rally in Abilipitiya yesterday under the theme Strength that Defeats Corruption. <laughs> Over the past three years, Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe has been crying more than the people did. He has been talking all this time about how the former government left them with a dead burden similar to the Meethota Mullah garbage dump. It's okay to lament during the first six months of government, but they should do something productive in the next two and a half years. We should warn him that if he continues to do so, he will lose his post in two years. He will fear this because he waited 27 years for this position. Meanwhile, President Maitri Balasirisina says he will punish all fraudsters with his ever-so-powerful sword. We request him not to sway it at campaign stages because S.B. Disanayaka, Nima Siripala, Dilan Pereira, Anurayapa, Susil Premajanth and Jagat Pushpakumara might get hurt. President Maitri Balasirisena and Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe have an agreement among themselves to collect votes on February 10th separately. But later they will say that people accepted the principles of the government, which happens to be a combination of both these parties. They are portraying a fake dispute to us. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel, Other Dharana 24-7. Earnings from exports grew 10.82% during the first nine months of 2017 to $10.4 billion compared to the corresponding period of 2016. According to the Export Development Board, T and April export earnings had continued to contribute to the increase in earnings. As per provisional statistics, services exports recorded a 5.8% growth registering $3.36 billion in revenue during the period from January to November of 2017. The Export Development Board expects earnings from merchandise and services exports to have recorded $15 billion in the entire year of 2017. The growth in exports in the first nine months of last year was mainly driven by industrial exports, which contributed almost two-thirds of total export earnings. Industrial export earnings grew by 6.12% year-on-year to $7.4 billion US dollars in the period, led by increased exports of apparel and rubber-finished products. Apparel exports to the EU market had increased by 2.21% year-on-year to $1.8 billion. US dollars. Earnings from agricultural exports increased substantially by 18.4% to $2.5 billion US dollars in the January to November period, mainly due to performance recorded in tea exports. Export earnings from tea increased significantly by 21.16% year-on-year to $1.4 billion US dollars, due to the higher tea prices fetched for Ceylon tea in the global market. The Minister of Finance penned an agreement with the Export-Import Bank of India to obtain a 45.27 million US dollar line of credit to rehabilitate and upgrade the Kankasanture Harbour. Finance Secretary Dr. R.H.S. Samaratunga signed the agreement on behalf of Sri Lanka in New Delhi with the Managing Director of Indian Exim Bank, David Raskinha. The fresh assistance will be utilized to upgrade the remaining two phases on the Kankasanture Harbour involving works relating to the rehabilitation of breakwater and existing pier of the harbour, construction of a new pier for commercial cargo handling and installation of port infrastructure facilities will also be undertaken with the funding. According to a communique released by the Finance Ministry, the project aims to promote traditional commercial linkages both domestic and regional, and give an incentive to economic activities by encouraging trade in the north. The harbour will serve as the nearest port for all eastern ports in India, as well as for Myanmar and Bangladesh. Taking a big blow, digital currencies tumbled with Bitcoin falling to a six-week low 
of 10,162 US dollars after reports said South Korea and China could ban trading, intensifying fears of a wider regulatory crackdown. Bitcoin traded at $10,968, down 3.7% in Asia, after a fall of 16.3% yesterday, its biggest daily decline in four months. Meanwhile, oil prices pulled back from three-year highs as traders booked profits, but healthy demand underpinned prices near $70 per barrel, a level not seen since the market slump in 2014. As digital currencies tumbled on worries about tighter regulations, Asian equities stepped back from a record high today as the region's resource shares were knocked by falling oil and commodity prices. European shares were expected to dip with futures pointing to a fall of 0.3% in Germany's DAX, 0.4% in France's CAC and 0.2% in Britain's FTSC. MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan retreated 0.3% from its record high as resource shares declined after oil and other commodities succumbed to profit-taking after recent gains. Japan's Nike fell 0.4% from its 26-year peak reached the previous day. Wall Street paused its rally hit by 1.2% fall in energy stocks. World shares have rallied since the start of this year on prospects of continued strong global growth and improving earnings in the US and elsewhere, with many analysts expecting an extension of the bull run in equities. In the currency market, the dollar was broadly weak, sticking near a three-year low against a basket of currencies. Oil prices driven by oil production curbs in OPEC nations and Russia and demand amid healthy economic growth pull back from three-year highs to a near $70 per barrel, a level not seen since the market slump in 2014. U.S. crude futures traded little change at 63.70 U.S. dollars per barrel after hitting a December 2014 peak of 64.89 U.S. dollars. Global benchmark Brent crude futures fetched 69.14 U.S. dollars a barrel. Colombo equities concluded the day's trading in negative territory today, while market turnover was a little under 500 million rupees. The ASI shed 8.27 to close at 6,439.34, while the SMPSL 20 index declined 10.62 to 3,736.54. Foreign investors were net buyers with a net inflow of 147 million rupees, as foreign participation accounted for about 39% of turnover. Meanwhile, the Sri Lankan rupee closed slightly firmer today as exporters sold dollars in late trade, outweighing early demand for the US currency from importers and banks. Here's a look at today's foreign currency rates. A 20-nation meeting on North Korea had agreed to consider imposing unilateral sanctions on North Korea that go beyond those required by UN Security Council resolutions. Officials of United States and Canada had informed of their decision in a joint statement following the meeting held in Vancouver in Canada yesterday. Co-hosted by the United States and Canada, the meeting was held to discuss North Korea's nuclear weapons program. While deciding to increase pressure on Pyongyang, the 20 foreign ministers at the Vancouver talks had also agreed to support the ongoing discussions between the North and the South. Japan said during the meeting that the world should not be blinded by Pyongyang's recent charm offensive. During a joint media briefing by the US and Canada, US Secretary of State Rex Tillerson called for increased pressure on Pyongyang to the point where it must come to the table for credible negotiations. Stand we're taking that we will never accept them as a nuclear power. It's time to talk, but they have to take the step that says they want to talk. China and Russia, two of Pyongyang's biggest allies, were not invited for the meeting. Both countries have been accused of not putting enough pressure on Pyongyang to stop it from developing its nuclear ambitions. China, meanwhile, dismissed the meeting as illegitimate. 
The U.S. State Department announced yesterday that it will withhold $65 million of aid to Palestinian refugees as the Trump administration implemented a threat it made two weeks ago to cut funding. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres expressed deep concern over the matter. The U.S. State Department notified the United Nations Relief and Workers Agency for Palestinian Refugees of their decision to provide aid of $60 million for the Palestinian refugees but withhold a further $65 million for the moment. In a tweet on January 2nd, U.S. President Donald Trump said that Washington gives the Palestinians hundreds of millions of dollars a year and get no appreciation or respect. While U.S. officials did not link the decision to Trump's tweet, they made a point by saying the United States had been UNRWA's single largest donor for decades and demanded other nations to do more. U.S. funds almost 30% of the U.N. agency's overall work and gave $370 million to UNRWA last year. Meanwhile, at the United Nations, Secretary General Antonio Guterres expressed concern over the decision by the U.S. First of all, UNRWA is not a Palestinian institution. UNRWA is a UN institution. And UNRWA is providing vital services to the Palestinian refugee population. Those services are of extreme importance, not only for the well-being of these populations, and there is a serious humanitarian concern here, but also, in my opinion, and the opinion that is shared by most uh, international observers, including some Israeli ones, it is an important factor of stability. Let's now take a look at some other stories making news across the world. At least three men in the southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu have been go to death while watching a bull taming contest. The controversial sport known as Jolly Kattu sees thousands of men chase bulls to grab prizes tied to their specially sharpened horns. Indian officials said that apart from the deaths yesterday, at least 60 others have suffered injuries. A baby elephant that fell into a ditch was rescued in southern China's Yunnan province recently. Local villagers have found the animal and called forest police at once. It was sent to the province's Asian Elephant Breeding and Relief Center for further medical treatment. The center says the elephant is almost one month old and its life is still in danger. The Mount Mayon volcano in the Philippines has begun spewing out lava after it began erupting over the weekend. Thousands of people have fled their homes as volcanologists warn that a hazardous explosion could take place within weeks or days. A spectacular roadshow was organized as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu arrived in India on an official six-day visit. According to Israeli officials, Netanyahu was pleasantly surprised by Modi welcoming him at the airport. Modi received Netanyahu and his wife Sarah at the airport. From there, the Prime Ministers travelled in a motorcade to Sabarmati Ashram, a hermitage which was set up by Mahatma Gandhi. You are watching Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel, Other Verena 24-7. Sikandar Raza, Hamilton, Masakadze and Tendai Chatara combined to lead Zimbabwe to a 12-round victory over Sri Lanka in the second ODI of the Tri-Nation Series in Bangladesh. Sri Lanka's poor run in 2017 stretched to 2018 as well as they lost their opening clash of the new year to Zimbabwe by 12 runs in Sherry Bangla National Stadium's 100th ODI on Wednesday. Sri Lanka won the toss and elected to field first. Zimbabwe, in their 50 overs, were able to put up a formidable total of 290 for 6, with Masakadza's 73 at the start and Sekunda Raza's unbeaten 81 at the end. In the end, Sri Lanka didn't have enough batsmen as they were bowled out for just 278, allowing Zimbabwe to win by 12 runs. This juncture. That's up in the air. Will it be out? This time it is. This time it is. Sekunda Raza, you... Taking a look at what's happening down under at the Australian Open, men in pink seem to be making headway as the likes of Kyle Edmund, Rafael Nadal and Nick Kyrgios charge uh, through their opponents with ease, all attired mostly in pink. But the main man of the Open defending champion and 20-time Grand Slam winner Roger Federer is falling closely behind. Rafael Nadal progressed to the last 32 of the Australian Open with a straight-set victory of 6-3, 6-4, 7-6, over Argentina's Leonardo Mayer in Melbourne's Rod Laver Arena. 
British number two, Kyle Edmund, reached the third round of the Open for the first time with a comprehensive win over Denis Istomin of Uzbekistan, ending on 6-2, 6-2, 6-4. Nick Kyrgios gave the home fans plenty to enjoy as he beat Victor Troicki to reach the Australian Open third round. Defending champion Roger Federer beat outclassed former Britain Aljaz Badin 6-3, 6-4, 6-3 to reach the Australian Open second round in Melbourne. Mainly fair weather will prevail over most parts of the island with fairly strong gusty winds of up to 40 km per hour expected in Uva province and in the Hambandota Ampar, Kandy, Kegol and Kaluthar districts. Misty conditions can be expected at some places in the island during the morning. Let's now take a look at your city by city forecast. And before we go, we'd like to bring you aerial visuals of the Jaffna Peninsula. Jaffna, which is the last capital of the ancient kingdom of Sri Lanka, is now the capital of the central province. We hope you enjoy the view. Have a good night. The news and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel. Other Varana 24 7.